you know, I've been in this business for over 30 years. And I would say this is the first time that I felt that affordable housing was on the front page. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernard, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. Our guest today in the Buzz House is a very familiar face in the affordable housing world and a friend of ours, Denise Muha. Of course, the longtime executive director of the National Leased Housing Association, or NLHA. Denise works on national housing policy and advocating for programs on Capitol Hill. NLHA provides advocacy, training, and information to providers of federally assisted rental housing. Denise has been part of housing legislation that addressed the preservation of more than 1.5 million affordable housing units under Section 8. Very, very excited to have Denise. So much going on in Washington right now and really excited uh, to jump in. Denise, always a fountain of knowledge. So we're gonna jump into our question and answer right away and I'm gonna turn it over to Garrick to start with the questions. Garrick? Thanks, Don. And Denise, so before we get into some questions, I know you know we have a, a several questions and we know you have a lot of information that you'd like to provide, but we would like to start out by letting our listeners know a little bit about your role as executive director at the National Lease Housing Association and NLHA's role in the industry. Okay, well, first I wanna say hello and thanks for having me. I've been around a long time and I really enjoy talking to everybody and sort of learning from you all, but I'll try to share you know, my knowledge today. Things are happening pretty fast and furious, which is a good thing and a bad thing, right? So National East Housing Association was formed in 1972 And the purpose of the organization was to bring together both public and private sector housing providers. Most specifically, these were people that were involved in a program called the Section 23 Leased Housing Program, which was really a federal program that provided rental assistance and where the housing authority would actually provide rental assistance to a landlord to lease to low-income tenants. And at one point, it actually became a development program. And that program was the genesis of Section 8 as we know it, both the voucher and the project-based program. So so that's where we started. And our goal has always been to really commit to the preservation and maintenance of low-income housing, federally assisted housing. And our membership, as I said, is both public and private sector. So we have owners, developers, managers, you know, affiliates, accountants, lenders, architects, as well as public housing authorities and state housing agencies. So everybody that's working on federally assisted housing, mostly in the Section 8 realm and the tax credit realm, but we also cover issues related to, you know, home and other grant programs and homelessness and stuff like that. So my job is to sort of direct the activities of the organization to gather information from our members to figure out, you know, what's going on out there, what people are hearing, experiencing, what things need to happen to make your operations run more smoothly, to expand access to affordable housing, you know, all those things. So sometimes it's high level issues like the things we're dealing with today when I'm going to talk about funding and reconciliation and, you know, infrastructure down to very nitty gritty issues related to compliance with audits, to rent comparability studies, to housing authorities having to be subject to some CMAP, you know, evaluations and how the money is allocated and wait list issues. So we get involved in a, a lot of things. And I think, as Garrett mentioned, you know, we provide information to our members through our newsletter primarily, but also, of course, emails and we have webinars and seminars and conferences and all that good stuff. So basically, we're trying to provide education, allow some networking and sharing of information, including best practices and, you know, be an advocacy group for the industry. Denise, that was a really uh, a lot of great information for our listeners. And for those of you who don't know about NLHA, I hope you, you know, check out their, their website and find out more information. So Denise, with, you know, you mentioned so much going on in Washington. I mean, affordable housing is on the tip of everyone's tongue and, and all the legislators. What are some of the top priorities for you and NLHA as far as legislation, you know, this year, kind of in this moment? 
Well, I think, as I just mentioned, there's a lot going on. And, you know, I've been in this business for over 30 years. And I would say this is the first time that I felt that affordable housing was on the front page. You know, I've been waiting for this my whole career. I've been begging people to pay attention to affordable housing and it's finally happening. And I, I you know, some of it is, you know, maybe took COVID to bring to light, but also, you know, just a change administration and sort of just attitudes about how do we spend our resources at, as, at the federal government level. So it's very exciting. So it's a good time to be a houser. There's so much to talk about, but I, I want I don't want to get too into the weeds, but so initially, you know, as soon as COVID hit, one of the first things we did was send out, you know, all these letters to the Hill and made a lot of calls about the need for emergency rental assistance. We like we knew that that was going to be an issue a little bit in the subsidized portfolio. But fortunately for subsidized tenants, if their income goes down, they can recertify. But sometimes with COVID, of course, they've had to spend their money on you know broadband or other things. And so they actually needed some help also. But we were mostly concerned about our tax credit providers and those properties because a lot of those properties house people that work in the hospitality industry or you know other areas that have been impacted by COVID. So we knew that it was going to you know gradually become a very big issue for some providers. So we were very happy that we were able to get two tranches of money. So we that was I spent a year doing that, and now that the money has been allocated. One of the things I'm working on is trying to get it out the door. So it's kind of embarrassing that Congress had almost $50 billion and only a couple billions been out there. Maybe I don't know how much today because it's not, not in what it should be. So we're still grappling with that, trying to get you know renters to apply, trying to get landlords to apply on behalf of their renters and work out how to do bulk payments. So we've been talking to the Treasury a lot, as well as the White House on these issues. So that's hopefully we're, we're getting close to getting some resolution there. So the next thing that you know we're always concerned about, of course, is funding for HUD. We're working on you know those issues, making sure that all the programs get the funding they need and more. And securing passage, of course, the uh, Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act is, is on our radar screen. And funding for housing under any infrastructure package. So that's a couple things, but it's like a lot because it's not all in one bill, of course. You have to, there's all these things that have to go on, but that's the main thing. So clearly funding for HUD, infrastructure is housing. I guess I can't say that enough. You know, or housing is infrastructure rather. And that we need the Tax Credit Improvement Act because we need more tax credit units out there. So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. That's a lot of stuff, Denise. <laughs> Thanks for that. And one, one thing that we always like to touch to on our calls is advocacy. Right. So what can our listeners do or what can our listeners be doing right now to help the industry? I can't stress enough for folks that are listening to this that it's really important to establish relationships with your elected representatives. You know, you might, you know, not want to go to the fundraisers and pay the big bucks that some people do, but certainly you can keep them informed about what you're doing in your affordable housing communities because you do a lot and they don't always know that. And and for years I've told members of Congress when I meet them, you know, finding out where they live and, and I'll say, well, you drive by such and such senior building every day, probably on your way to the airport. And they're like, what? That's section eight, you know? So they need to see it and understand it. And a lot of our members have done incredible things, particularly through this COVID, you know, actually hosting vaccination sites, you know, at the property, food banks, just a, a plethora of things that it's really important to share with the politicians. And to the extent you can get them to the project, even better. You know, certainly we advise people to, you know, have a birthday party for the people with a senior project turning 100 or, you know, the 10th anniversary of your opening or your opening just to get them out there. And even if you can't get them out there, if you can get their staff engaged, because a lot of times the staff will come. And once you, the staff knows who you are and that you're in affordable housing space, they're going to rely on you as a resource. And that is invaluable. So when something comes up in their office and there, somebody says something about a bill that deals with affordable housing or federally assisted housing, they'll like remember and they'll call you up and say, well, what do you think about this? And that's a good time to get your voice known and heard. And, you know, it's important just to engage them. It's, it's not something that's always on the top of people's list because they're so busy, but 
it is important. I mean, you know, I do that, you know, and they know me, but, you know, it's not the same thing as knowing somebody in their community who is their constituent, who provides a valuable housing to, to their constituents, as well as services. And, you know, I've been to a lot of things where the politician comes because, one, they want the voters to see that they're out and about in the community. And so one piece of advice before you have a politician out, tour, have them tour the property before you have them start speaking. Because once they start speaking, they like speak and run, but you want them to see what you've done and, and all the things that you offer. So to, number one, that's more, most important. And two, you know, when the, the groups that you belong to send out messages, you know, please contact your congressman with this message or, you know, this fact sheet, you know, please do it because it, you think it doesn't make a difference, but it does. And they pay attention to that stuff. They may not, it may not seem like it to you, but they, they truly do. So I, I would hope that if nothing else, then this podcast, we can encourage people to become more engaged. Denise, that was really, really good advice. And like you said, hopefully it's a, it's a good takeaway for, for all of us in the industry. Denise, getting back to one point you mentioned on what's going on, you said obviously just funding HUD, right? The HUD budget and so forth. And we know we've been eagerly following it through the house and things like that. We've seen numbers of maybe as much as a 12% increase. What are really the, the next steps? You know, how do we maintain that 12%? What are the next steps? And what are some highlights that, that you're excited about, if that's the case? Well, this is where it gets confusing because there's so many little things going on. So the president proposes his budget, which was fantastic because it, you know, asked for, uh, I think it's almost 15% increase for HUD, mostly in the form of vouchers and money for public housing capital needs, which is, is important. And typically what happens when the president puts his budget forward, usually the House and the Senate, they'll pass a budget resolution. Sometimes they don't even do that. And then the appropriators do their job and they'll fund how they want to fund it. And sometimes they listen to the president, sometimes they totally ignore it, and sometimes they do something in between. So this year, because of the infrastructure bill, there's a whole lot more activity. So the first thing is, you know, there's always the appropriations process. So regardless if they do a budget resolution, they're going to have an appropriations bill for all these different entities and government agencies. And HUDs is, they're paired with transportation. So the HUD transportation piece actually has already been processed in the House. They actually passed their bill late July, last couple of days of July, which would provide the increased funding, most of which uh, was requested by the president. I don't think they went as far. It's about I think 300 million less than what the president asked for, which is incredible. That never happens. It never happens. So this is a huge increase for HUD that we have not seen in, in decades. So the Senate will have to do the similar thing. But going on at the same time, of course, is all this infrastructure activity. So the, today, the Senate actually passed the infrastructure bill that's the bipartisan bill that the president negotiated, which is really not housing. It's all the standard infrastructure like roads and bridges and so forth. So that whole piece will have, it's, it'll have a whole cycle of things that have, have to happen. And right now they're into what they call the voterama. So a budget reconciliation bill is just basically a framework of what they want to spend. And I think the Senate bill is like three some trillion dollars. And they have, you know, things that they want to spend it on, but then People make amendments to that to up, you know, increase or decrease those amounts. But then the authorizing committees, which are like the Senate Banking Committee and so forth, they have to come up with actually what goes in those slots. Like, how do we spend that money? So there have been bills that have been introduced, like, for example, in the House, Maxine Waters has a bill that housing is infrastructure, and that would do a whole bunch of things, including allow vouchers for anybody that's eligible, which would be absolutely huge. I don't think that's going to happen. But it's certainly something we, you know we're, we would support. A lot more money for the housing trust fund. You know, a lot more money actually for project based Section Eight to actually have new project based Section Eight, which would we haven't had since 19 what 70 something. So that's going on. And then there is this other second resolution, this reconciliation that's going to include all these non housing issues, right? So that's where the rubber meets the road as far as our issues go. So that sort of more has more of the social infrastructure pieces, and um, which I, I mentioned includes the things that like Maxine Waters is trying to get. So that's that's sort of a two track thing going on. So it's hard to explain, but the budget framework in reconciliation, the reason why they're doing it that way is because they only need 50 votes in the Senate to pass a reconciliation bill. 
So if they can get all the Democrats to vote for it and get the vice president to break the tie, they can pass something that normally wouldn't pass. And so that's why you're seeing it loaded up with all these things, including a lot of housing things. But on the appropriations side, you know, they're going to be constrained and they the, the appropriators have a pot of money and they each get a slice. There's 12 appropriations bills. And so the HUD piece, they get, you know, here X your dollars and this is, you allocate how you want to. So most likely the Senate's going to take their uh, lead from the president's budget and from the House. So we haven't seen their legislation yet, but we expect that to be released in the fall. So what should happen is that the House passes their HUD funding bill, which they did. The Senate passes theirs. They have a conference and then we get a bill. But because of all this other activity with the reconciliation and the infrastructure. So the infrastructure bill that is bipartisan, if it passes the House and when it is passed, it won't contain any housing and it'll be separate. But the other reconciliation bill, assuming that moves forward, it's possible that, that the HUD appropriation bills will be attached as well as other appropriation bills to that reconciliation. And it'll be like one huge bill, which we like to call an omnibus. And if that happens, you know, you might get a little more than what we've seen or was proposed at least by the appropriators. So the bottom line is, even if we just get the appropriations bill, which is for sure going to happen, we'll get, we will get funding for HUD. May not be on time by September 30, because, you know, we don't have a good record of meeting that deadline when the fiscal year ends, but it will happen and we will see more money. I, I can guarantee that. But these other things all the vouchers for, um, you know, everybody that's eligible, the money for a trust fund, the money for uh, project base, the money for a lot of uh, sustainable housing issues for homelessness. A lot of those big, big dollar amounts, you know, might be negotiated down as part of, the, of this reconciliation. And so we'll see. And that, that's less certain, but it's very exciting that we're going to get a lot more money. At, you know, it's, the House bill has 125,000 new vouchers. We haven't seen new vouchers of that magnitude since like 97 or 98. And I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, I don't want to mention his name, but he's now the former governor of New York, but he was actually responsible for getting those vouchers way back when. And I, we've not seen that since. So that would be a huge win. So we're, we're excited. It's, it's a lot going on. I'm sorry. I know it's confusing, but, and I think that that Tax Credit Improvement Act, there's a good chance that that will be put into the, the second reconciliation, the social reconciliation bill, as it were. So I'm optimistic, and I think everybody should be somewhat optimistic. Oh, thank you for that, Denise. I mean, you know, Don and I have really just kind of been following all of this, and we've had <laughs> a lot of guests that have talked about it as well. And, you know, we've kind of been short-sighted in the fact that we've really just been focusing on what's there, right? Because that's where it's all going to start. So, right. you know, in that, right, where we, we basically have talked a lot about the next 12 months and where we're going to be. But what are what are other long-term housing goals that you are currently working on or see as needs in the industry? Well, one of the things that's close to my heart is services for low-income families and seniors. And over the years, I've seen a big change in what providers do. When I first started, it was bricks and sticks. You know, we, we don't do services. Don't talk to us about services. And of course, as people were, you know, providing new, new developments and particularly in the senior realm, their seniors started to age. And so just as a matter of course, they had to start providing services to keep their seniors because nobody wants a bunch of turnover. And so the services, I think, increased. And HUD actually started to encourage that with service coordinators and stuff like that. But we still, it's still a fight, you know, with HUD to, to really recognize the value of those services. But, you know, we did a, some um, research a couple of years ago on project-based Section 8. And we were able to see that, you know, providing services to seniors particularly keeps them in their housing longer, which is a huge savings to the treasury. So, you know, people could argue about how much it costs to subsidize project-based Section 8 every year. And, you know, we hear that. But the reality is for those seniors, if they go to a nursing home, you know, that subsidized rent, which is maybe average seven, eight hundred dollars a month, is seven to eight thousand dollars a month. And Medicaid pays for that because these are low income seniors. So, you know, while these are different silos as far as Congress is concerned, it's still real money coming out of the Treasury. So that's something that, you know, I keep working on trying to encourage HUD to be more flexible about allowing service provision in these properties. 
The other thing is just general preservation. You know, the stock that I work with mostly is the project-based Section 8 stock. And, you know, even if the infrastructure bill provides more, which, you know, we'll see, we have to maintain that stock. It's, it would be incredibly prohibitive to reproduce it. And not only is it good, solid housing, it's located in neighborhoods all across the country. So when people are talking about equity and, and making sure that people are in neighborhoods with opportunity, that's Section 8, because it may not have been built initially in a neighborhood of, ex, of opportunity, but it's there now because the, the neighborhoods have shifted. So it's so key. And it's, you know, that, you know, that does eat up a lot of my time because I'm very passionate about it. And the other thing that I work on a, a lot at NLHA is very active. We have a foundation called the NLHA Education Fund. And we formed that in, uh, I think, 2007. And we provide scholarships to tenants. And we've been, I think this, we just had our round for 20. 21 and I think we allocated something like ninety thousand dollars or something. So over time, we've given well over a million dollars, almost a million and a half dollars. So that's important to me, and uh, I will continue to keep working on that. Of course, as well as you know, improving the tax credit program, expanding it when we need to, and you know, naturally keep an eye on HUD because, like I said, a lot of my job is to make sure that they don't make our lives too miserable. Well, Denise, that was really, really helpful, really good insights, good information, thinking about not only now, but the future. So really, I really want to thank Denise for joining the Buzz House today. And listeners, thank you for tuning in today as well. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com.